all set, Tom. Oh, great. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Armitage. I'm going to wait just another minute. We're still getting some people coming on. So we'll wait just a minute. Okay, it's a little bit after one, so I, I guess we'll get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Armitage. I'm uh, from the EPA Science Advisory Board office. I'm the designated federal officer for the EPA Science Advisory Board. And I'd like to convene this meeting of the Chartered Science Advisory Board, and I'm just gonna make a few remarks as the DFO before we begin. The SAB is meeting today and on Wednesday the 20th to conduct quality reviews of two SAB draft reports and uh, also to discuss recommendations received from a work group of SAB work group for review of science supporting planned EPA actions. First, I'd like to note that the EPA Science Advisory Board is an independent expert federal advisory committee it's chartered under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act and empowered by law to provide scientific and technical advice to the EPA administrator. It's chartered under the Federal Advisory Committee Act and uh, the discussions of SAB, I'm, as DFO, I'm here to make sure that the interactions of the SAB with the public and the agency are conducted uh, in con compliance with the Federal Advisory Committee Act. 
The Federal Advisory Committee Act also requires that public meetings provide an opportunity for public comment. And there is a public comment period on the agenda for this meeting. Members of the public who have registered in advance with the SAB office can make oral comments during the comment period. And I will note that we have received a request from a member of the public to provide comments at this meeting. We've also received written public comments and any written comments received from the public are provided to SAB members and posted on the SAB meeting website. I also wanna note that minutes of this meeting will be prepared to summarize the discussion and the action items and the minutes will be certified by the SAB chair and posted on the SAB website. We're holding this uh, meeting virtually using Zoom and I wanna let all meeting attendees know that we have provided members of the public access to the meeting through a teleconference line and uh, the link to that is available on the SAB website. And there's also a live webcast on the SAB website. The SAB consists of special government employees appointed by the EPA. Board members are serving as independent scientific and technical experts and not as representatives of any group. And as government employees, all SAB members are subject to applicable ethics laws and implementing regulations. So I'd like to inform everyone at the meeting today that the SAB office has determined that SAB members participating in this meeting have no financial conflicts of interest or appearance of lack of impartiality concerning the topics on the agenda. I will note that one SAB member, Dr. Barbara Beck, has recused herself from the discussion uh, of the draft report uh, on the uh, PFAS report. So that will be on Wednesday. Before I take roll, I'd just like to note several other points. For the record, I'd like to ask those listening to the webcast to send me an email. My email address is available on the SAB website to let me know that you uh, we're attending the meeting through the webcast. So now I'm just going to take the role SAB members <clears throat> before I turn it over to uh, Dr. Cullen. So please indicate that you're here when I call your name. Dr. Allison Cullen. Present. Dr. Marjorie Aleon. Present. Dr. David Allen. Present. Dr. Susan Annenberg. Dr. Florence Anoro. Dr. Joe Arbai. Present, sorry. Florence oh. Anoro is present. Got it. Dr. Joe Arbai. Joe Arbai is here as well, thank you. Uh, Dr. Barbara Beck. Present. Dr. Roland Benke. Present. Dr. Tammy Bond. <laughs> Dr. Mark Borsak. Present. Dr. Sylvie Bruder. Present. Dr. Jay Chakraborty. Present. Dr. Amin Chen. Dr. Amy Childress. Dr. Wei Su Chu. Dr. Ryan Emanuel. Present. Dr. Earl Fordham. Present. Dr. John Guckenheimer. Present. Dr. Steve Hamburg. Present. Dr. Marcus Hendricks. Dr. Celine Hernandez Ruiz. Dr. Alina Irwin. Present. Dr. David Kaiser. Present. Dr. Mark Le Chevalier. Dr. Angela Lung. Present. Dr. Ms. Lisa Lone Fight. Present. Dr. Lala Ma. Present. Dr. John Morris. Present. Dr. Enid Neptune. Dr. Sheila Olmsted. Dr. Austin Omer. Present. 
Dr. Gloria Post. Present. Dr. Christy Pullen Fednick. Present. Dr. Amanda Rodewald. Present. Dr. Emma Rossi. Present. Dr. Jonathan Samet. Present. Dr. Leanne Shepard. Dr. Drew Schindel. Dr. Janice Smith. Present. Dr. Richard Smith. Dr. Daniel Stram. Present. Dr. Peter Thorne. Present. Dr. Godfrey Uzo Chakwu. Present. Dr. Wei Sun Wang. Present. Dr. June Weintraub. Present. Dr. Sakobi Wilson. Dr. Dominic van der Mensbrug. Present. And the board liaisons, Dr. Daniel Schlenk. Present. Dr. Dina Schur. Present. Dr. Bob Chapin. Dr. Paul Gilman. Present. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, with that, I'm now going to turn the meeting over to Tom Brennan, Director of the SAB Office, for some introductory remarks, and then to Dr. Cullen, Chair of the SAB. Thank you, Tom, and welcome everyone to this public meeting of the Science Advisory Board. Uh, during this two-day meeting, as Tom mentioned, uh, part of the agenda will be to, to conduct two quality reviews, which are the last formal step and an important part of the SAP's peer review process. I always get excited when we do quality reviews because all the hard work that we've done over the months leading up to this are getting near the finish line. So I uh, thank you for that. Uh, and I'd like to thank all the members for the hard work leading up to today. And uh, since Tom had mentioned refusals earlier, uh, just to thank you in public, for all the hard work you do to make sure that all the ethics compliances are done correctly. Um, you know, I, as the deputy ethics official, I check those uh, very seriously and I really appreciate everyone um, doing such a great job of uh, thoughtful self-reporting when it comes to their ethics requirements. So thank you all. And finally, what I always say to this group, I know I say it a lot, but your public service is uh, very much appreciated by me and by the agency. So thank you for all the hard work you're doing. I'd also like to comment that uh, today's meeting has a, a big flair, or this week's meeting from Office of Water. And I'd like to thank the staff and the management from the Office of Water who developed the reports that we'll be reviewing uh, these next couple of meeting days. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, my staff and the SAB staff office and our contractors who uh, always work so hard to make these sure that these meetings come together smoothly and that uh, we're ready and prepared. Uh, special thanks to Tom our, our board DFO, but thank you to the whole team. And with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Cullen. Take it away. Thanks so much, Tom and Tom, and the whole SAB staff office really appreciate your work. Um, I'm Allison Cullen, I'm chair of the EPA Science Advisory Board, and I would like to welcome members of the Chartered Science Advisory Board, the SAB liaisons, the EPA staff, and others to the public meeting that we're having today of the EPA Science Advisory Board. I'll begin by reviewing the purpose of the meeting and the meeting agenda. The Chartered Board is meeting today and on July 20th, so later in the week, to conduct SAB business and review, receive information from the EPA. The SAB will be conducting quality reviews, as you've heard, of two SAB draft reports developed by panels from the SAB. And then we'll also discuss recommendations received from the work group of the SAB for review of science supporting EPA decisions with regard to review of planned EPA regulatory actions. In addition, the SAB will receive a briefing from EPA on the agency's drinking water health advisories for PFAS chemicals. As indicated on the meeting agenda, we'll first hear public comments. Public comments will be limited to three minutes per speaker. And if there are questions from SAB members for the speakers, I would like to limit that to one or two questions per speaker and then ask that the speakers also provide brief responses. There is a second public comment on the agenda. So members of the public who would like to provide short two or three minute clarifying comments near the end of the meeting on July 20th should send an email to the designated federal officer, Tom Armitage, who you just heard from. 
Please send those emails before the scheduled break at the July 20th meeting. His email address is on the SAB meeting website. After hearing the public comments today, we will conduct a quality review of the SAB draft report titled Review of the EPA's Draft Fifth Contaminant Candidate List, CCL5. This report was developed by the SAB Drinking Water Committee and was augmented with several additional experts. All reports prepared by the SAB committees and panels undergo a quality review, such as the one we're doing today, um, in order to be approved by the chartered SAB before they're transmitted to the administrator. And then following the quality review of the CCL5 report today, we'll discuss recommendations provided to the chartered SAB in a memorandum from the work group for review of science supporting EPA decisions. This work group memo um, sent recommendations to the SAB concerning review of the science supporting eight of the planned EPA regulatory actions. And then we will decide as a board whether we agree with the work group's recommendations and decide on any follow-up activities that might be needed. The memorandum providing work group recommendations is also posted in the materials for the meeting on the SAB website. And then on Wednesday, July 20th, we'll reconvene um, at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. where I am on the West Coast. And we'll first receive a briefing from EPA's Office of Water. This is on the agency's drinking water health advisories for PFAS chemicals. And then we will then conduct a quality review of the SAB draft report titled Review of EPA's Analyses to support EPA's national primary drinking water rulemaking for PFAS. This report was developed by the SAB PFAS review panel. So before we begin today, I'd like to ask SAB members if you have any questions about items on the agenda or about the agenda. All right, so we will proceed. All right, so we've arrived at the time to hear from members of the public who've registered to provide oral public comments. Speakers will prevent, present their comments in the order um, in which requests were received by the SAB staff office. Um, I ask that the comments be limited, as I said, to no more than three minutes, and then we'll move to SAB member questions. Um, please note that the SAB has also received written public comments, and the written comments are posted on the meeting webpage and have been made available to um, SAB members. So we have one speaker uh, as a public comment today, and that is Stephen Risotto from the American Chemistry Council. Go ahead, Mr. Risotto. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Steve Risotto, and I'm a senior director at the American Chemistry Council. Thank you for the opportunity to provide brief comments. ACC supports the development of national drinking water standards for PFOA and PFOS. We are deeply concerned about EPA's draft approach to developing MCL goals for these two substances, however, and about the agency's decision to announce the draft goals as interim life health advisories prior to the completion of the board's review. Our concerns are based on two main issues. The data from the Faroe Islands are not an appropriate basis for human health risk assessment for either PFOA or PFOS. And if the agency's conclusion is that PFOA is a likely carcinogen, then the MCL goal should be set at zero, consistent with the EPA's longstanding policy. The epidemiology data that do not provide clear evidence of an association with reduced vaccine response in children. The researchers observed an association between maternal serum concentrations and antibodies in only one of two cohorts of children investigated, the cohort with the lower serum concentrations of the two substances. Moreover, the evidence for an increase in infection rates among children is conflicting. Contrary to EPA's analysis, the National Toxicology Program concluded that there is low confidence that exposure to either PFOA or PFOS is associated with an increased incidence of infectious disease or a lower ability to respond to infectious disease. Finally, EPA did not conduct its own benchmark dose analysis of the vaccine response data. The detailed output from the 2018 model that is the basis for the agency's conclusion has not been made available to stakeholders. The values selected by EPA for its assessments come from the earlier cohort of children for which an association was not statistically significant when appropriate confounding factors were considered. Although the modelers report evidence of a significant association after combining this cohort with the later group, Conflicting findings between the two groups raise concern about the validity of the joint analysis. 
The PFAS panel has recommended that the EPA look at other non-cancer health endpoints as part of its assessment, including fetal growth and serum lipids. The available EPI studies of reduced birth weight are conflicting, however, with two of the five studies reporting no significant association. Although there is some evidence for an association with a modest increase in serum lipids in, in humans, moreover, the increase does not correlate with increased cardiovascular disease. Accordingly, the C8 science panel found no evidence of a link with disease. Similarly, the study suggesting association between renal cell carcinoma and PFOA exposure is limited in size and does not show a clear dose response in the quartile analysis. Although the researchers reported a positive trend when considering continuous exposures, there is need for additional sensitivity analysis to evaluate the significance of the finding. The lack of a clear response in other EPI studies and the absence of supporting bioassay data undermines the relevance of the renal cell findings. However, if EPA concludes that PFOA is a likely carcinogen under its 2005 cancer guidelines, the MCL goal should be set at zero. This is consistent with the agency's practice for other substances considered to be possible carcinogens. While it has been some time since EPA has established an MCL goal, the agency has given no indication of its plan to change this approach. The MCL goal is considered an aspirational one. Setting the goal at zero will help allevi alleviate the communications nightmare that the agency has created with its recently announced interim health advisories while being no less protective. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Uh, members, are there questions for Mr. Risotto? Thank you. Looks like we don't have any. Uh, so once again, I would thank you for your comments and remind others who would like to register uh, for the second public comment period um, to do so with Tom Armitage. All right, so we will now begin the quality review of the SAB draft report titled Review of EPA's Draft Fifth Contaminant Candidate List. This is CCL5. As I said, quality review of SAB panel and committee reports is a key function of the chartered SAB. The board must make a determination about the quality of all draft reports. So first we'll hear a brief introduction from Dr. June Weintraub, chair of the SAB committee that developed the CCL5 report. The review of EPA's draft fifth contaminant candidate list was conducted by the SAB drinking water committee augmented with additional experts. Then we will hear comments from SAB members who were designated as lead reviewers. The lead reviewers for the CCL5 report are Drs. Barbara Beck, Eamon Chen, Gloria Post, Christy Pullen-Fednick, and Peter Thorne. After hearing lead reviewer comments, I will ask Dr. Weintraub to provide a brief response. And then I will ask SAB members for any additional comments as part of the quality review discussion. I want to remind everyone our quality review discussion focuses on four questions that are responsibility of the chartered SAB. And these are whether the original charge questions to the SAB panel were adequately addressed, whether there are any technical errors or omissions in the report or issues that are inadequately dealt with in the SAB panel's report that need to be addressed, whether the SAB panel's report is clear and logical, and whether the conclusions drawn or the recommendations that are provided are supported by the body of the SAB panel report. And then I will entertain a motion about the disposition of the draft report. All right, so I would now like to ask Dr. Weintraub to summarize the report. Thank you. Thank you. There's a PowerPoint that you all should be able to see. So thanks for the introduction. I am Dr. June Weintraub. I was the review committee chair for the SAB CCL5 um, review. And we can go to the next slide. So this is just a summary of the process that we undertook. Starting in January, we had a briefing from EPA on the CCL process and a discussion of the charge questions. We then had a two-day meeting in February where we deliberated on the charge questions. 
we received uh, comments and had some um, lead uh, leaders for each of the charge questions working in groups and together we collaborated to make a final re draft report. We had a meeting then on June 6th to review that report and um, the report that you all have had a chance to review in advance of this meeting is the result of that uh, final draft review on June 6th. So next slide. So the committee reviewed three support documents. They were the technical support documents for the draft CCL5 for the chemical contaminants, the technical support document for the draft CCL5 microbial contaminants, and the technical support document for the draft CCL5 contaminant information sheets. And then we also had the body of the report, which is the actual draft CCL5. Next slide, please. So just a little background for those who are not familiar with the CCL process. This is uh, something that is required by the Safe Drinking Water Act. And every five years, EPA is asked to identify a list of contaminants that are not currently subject to any proposed or promulgated national primary drinking water regulations. And the list is, of, of contaminants is meant to be put together for EPA to consider whether they might require regulation in the future. So the draft list becomes the final list, and this is the list that identifies the priorities for potential future regulations, and it's also used to inform research and monitoring needs. Through this process, the EPA considers health effects and occurrence information, and um, this is for any, again, unregulated contaminant um, that, that we can consider that may be of public health concern. Um, in a separate agency action, the EPA is then required to select a minimum of five contaminants from the CCL to undergo regulatory determination and decide whether to regulate contaminants within the existing framework. Safe Drinking Water Act requires the agency to consult with the scientific community, including the SAB, and that's what this process has um, been fulfilling. Next slide. So you all are probably familiar with the agency charge questions. We've been um, presented with these before, and basically there are four separate questions that um, Allison also summarized. We are meant to comment on whether the Federal Register notice that was first published on July 19th, 2021, and the associated support documents are clear and transparent in presenting the approach that was used by the EPA to list the contaminants on that draft CCL5, and if not, to provide suggestions. The second charge question is to comment on the process used to derive the draft CCL5, including any improvements that could be suggested for assessing potential drinking water exposure, considering sensitive populations, and prioritizing contaminants that would be of the greatest public health concern. And charge question three is based on experience and expertise. Are there any contaminants that are on the CCL5 that should not be listed, and we're asked to provide support for that, um, anything that's identified. And then question four is the converse of that, based on expertise and experience, are there any contaminants which are not on the draft CCL5 that should be listed? And again, we're asked to provide support. So next slide. If you uh, take a look at the draft uh, review document, you can see we summarized our key recommendations in the covering letter. And then as you move through the document, 
um, for each of the charge questions there, we provide tier one, two, and three recommendations. Um, we extracted some of the key recommendations here on this slide. So the first one was, is that for the use of occurrence information for unregulated contaminants to develop the draft CCL5, we recommended that the EPA clarify the type of occurrence data that were included or rejected for consideration in development of the list. In particular, we would like to have a clarification of how the literature review for chemical contaminants in the preliminary contaminant candidate list was conducted and used. We also were asking for clarification on the reason that expert opinion appeared to weigh more heavily in the identification for microbial contaminants compared to chemical contaminants. We recommended that the included data that supported the CCL5 development um, for clarification of the criteria for the dates of sampling and publication of results that, um, that were relied upon for deciding whether to include or exclude wastewater effluent data. And the fourth bullet here is the SAB provided recommendations regarding consideration of sensitive populations, asking for more clarification of why immunosuppressed individuals are not considered sensitive populations, and asking for elaboration on how the sensitive populations were evaluated for chemical contaminant risks and to specify the terminology regarding chronic disease and serious illness as risk factors when assessing the microbial contaminant risks. Next slide. Uh, we had a few recommendations for regarding the use of groups. Um, we support the use of groups. We asked for a rationale explaining why some compounds are listed as groups and some aren't. In addition, um, we asked for clarification on whether individual contaminants or subgroups within the groups should be prioritized. We would like some further information on the criteria that was used for grouping the individual PFAS and the disinfection byproducts within the CCL5 and for uh, improved clear communication on the relative levels of potential risk and the gaps in information needed to craft risk management decisions for PFAS. And the fourth bullet regarding groups is, was that we recommended that the EPA elaborate on how listing contaminants as groups impacts the regulatory process. Next slide. Um, so we also asked for some, a little bit more information on the table that was used to include the, dis to describe which disinfection byproducts were, um, were included in the draft CCL5, or actually we, we remarked that we enjoyed that table and um, recommended that something similar be developed for PFAS. Um, we thought that it could be used to, um, to help communicate how that grouping is, um, is decided. And if, furthermore, we suggested that EPA consider expanding the definition of PFAS to be more expansive and capture all the relevant fluorinated compounds and degradates in commercial use or entering the environment. We had uh, some long discussions about waterborne disease outbreaks as a criterion for microbial contaminant selection. And we asked um, for that section to be expanded and relocated earlier in the Federal Register notice and um, suggested that there be a clear outline of what is actually defined as a waterborne disease outbreak, the limitations associated with the underlying data and how the data that are available were used in the selection process. And lastly, how sensitive populations it were considered in the waterborne disease outbreak um, component. 
And the third bullet on this page is that we provided recommendations regarding prioritizing contaminants with the greatest health risks. We recommend renaming health effects to health risks in the CCL5 documents. And that was largely because um, we had a discussion about the difference between, um, between a known effect and a uh, presumption of calculating what the possible risk was. Um, I know one of the comments that the reviewers have made, we may end up wanting to discuss this a little more. Um, we also recommended removing Shigella from the final CCL5 and um, provided some supporting discussion of why, and we included some additional bisphenols um, as a suggestion. Um, in addition to the saxitoxin, the bis bisphenol F and bisphenol S should include other saxitoxins, including the neo STX and D STX on the final CCL5. And next slide. For future CCLs, this is the tier three recommendations. Um, in general, we found that the CCL5 development process is clear and transparent. We were able to identify a few areas to improve for the future. First of all, um, to look at employing machine learning as well as data gathered from Europe um, during the REACH process to help identify additional compounds of concern. We suggest considering identifying and assessing byproducts, impurities, transformation products, including metabolites and degradates, antimicrobials, microplastics, and nanoparticles in the creation of the chemical universe. Um, we suggest that looking at per persistent and mobile organic compounds could help to identify and prioritize chemicals of particular concern for, for drinking water in future CCLs. And lastly, we noted that the USGS would be ending its contaminant monitoring program and suggest that EPA develop a strategy to address the forthcoming gap in occurrence data that we anticipate will arise from that. I think, is that the last slide? Yeah, uh, any questions? Thanks, Dr. Weintraub. Uh, let's move into the lead reviewers and then we can continue taking questions all along the way. But that was an excellent introduction, thanks. So I'd like to ask the lead reviewers to summarize their comments in response to the quality review questions. We'll start with Dr. Barbara Beck. Um, thank you, Dr. Cullen. Um, I, have, I started off in my comments with some brief comments regarding charge question three, whether the report is clear and logical. I think that overall the report is quite clear and logical and I do provide some suggestions where I think additional clarification would be helpful for the reader, such as definition of capital N-O-R-M-A-N or providing that the date that the USGS uh, water survey program stops. Um, I had, more comments regarding one particular uh, issue as to whether there is an issue that wasn't adequately dealt with. And specifically, I refer to the comments on manganese where the recommend or suggestion is that EPA consider moving manganese from the draft to the final CCL5. Um, as I'll discuss in a minute or so, while I do think that's a reasonable recommendation, I do think that much of the basis for that suggestion provides limited scientific support for that proposition. Uh, for example, it cites epidemiological studies that are cross-sectional versus cohort studies. Um, it links Parkinson's uh, to manganese-induced Parkinsonism, which are very different. Um, disease constellations, although there is some overlap um, and there's some uh, issue in general with respect to using some of the high level inhalation studies in workers where the manganese 
associated Parkinsonism has been observed to exposures in drinking water. However, I do think that there has been a great deal of research done on manganese since the initial um, reference dose was set, which was in 1995. So that's almost, well, that's about 25 years ago. And, uh, and since the associated health advisory limit was set in 2004. Uh, two broad areas of research that I think are supportive of considering um, the move of manganese from the draft to the final CCL5, or at least doing a more robust assessment. One is that there have been a number of physiologically based pharmacokinetic models developed on manganese that are very helpful in relating manganese via ingestion in different populations, young children, the elderly, to body burdens of manganese that consider factors such as the role of homeostasis, the absorption of manganese from different sources and so forth, that can be very helpful, not only in interpreting the epidemiological studies, but in understanding the impact of different concentrations of manganese in drinking water on body burden, which would be an important consideration in considering the need for moving it to the final CCL5. The other point is that the epidemiological literature has evolved over time. There are some cohort studies now which are uh, more robust than some of the cross-sectional studies. And there are a number of scientific organizations also discussed by Dr. Gloria Post that have done fairly uh, detailed analyses of manganese. Uh, for example, Health Canada might be one good starting point. That's 2019. They've considered some of the more recent studies. They've developed a uh, MCL that's based on neurotoxicological findings in rats with some support from the human literature. And importantly, they recommend an MCL, which I realize is not the CCL listing is just the first step in that process, but they recommend an MCL of 0.12 milligrams per liter. So it's uh, more than 50% lower than the present health advisory level of 0.3 milligrams per liter. So I do think that uh, the manganese section is worth an additional look. And so I, I have no further comments. Thanks, Dr. Beck. Uh, let's move to the next lead reviewer and then maybe Dr. Weintraub, you could respond in, in toto at the end. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, so we have comments from Dr. Amin Chen and I'm representing those since I don't believe Dr. Chen is with us. And then um, if there's further comments on those, we can, we can certainly relay them. So let's, I'll just go in order. Um, First, were the charge questions of the committee adequately addressed? Uh, Dr. Chen says the charge questions are adequately addressed using three tiers of responses, the tier one for short-term, tier two for suggestions, tier three for future. Each of the charge questions have been analyzed and responses are well-reasoned. Uh, second, are there any technical errors or omissions or issues that are not adequately dealt with? Uh, Dr. Chen says, I did not find any technical errors or omissions or issues that are not adequately dealt with. Uh, number three, is the draft report clear and logical? Um, Dr. Chen agrees that the draft report is clear and logical. And then number four, are the conclusions drawn or recommendations provided supported by the body of the draft report? Um, yes, conclusions drawn and recommendations provided are supported. These include providing similar approach for expert opinion weighing for microbials and for chemicals, expanding definition for PFAS, removing Shigella Sinai um, and adding additional bisphenols and other saxotoxins to the final CCL5. So those are Dr. Chen's comments. Uh, let's move to Dr. Gloria Post. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good, thanks. So um, I'll go through each of the charge questions, my, or the questions that we were asked, my um, responses. Number one, I 
the charge questions were adequately addressed. As far as any additional information or omissions, I had comments on dioxane and manganese for question number two. The draft um, EPA C CCL report stated that dioxane was a byproduct included in the draft CCL5 through nomination and might not and that it might not be adequately captured um, in the universe using existing data sources. I thought that by it, it can be a, it is a byproduct in of some um, production of some consumer products to my knowledge maybe other things too but that's not the only source or probably the major source and by stating that it was a byproduct and not going into anything else I thought other information about sources um, should be added because they're important it's used as a solvent and a component in the manufacture of different products and there's a citation in my comments, but historically the vast majority of it in the past was, and it can be persistent in the environment, it breaks down slowly. 90% in the past was used as a stabilizer for chlorinated solvents, so it was used along with other solvents such as 111 trichloroethane, and that use is a major source of groundwater contamination, and I didn't think that was kept unless I missed it, I didn't think that was captured in EPA's report. And I didn't see anything about, unless I missed it, the very frequent occurrence of 1,4-dioxane in the unregulated contaminant monitoring rule 3, UCMR 3, which was conducted in 2013 to 15 of all large public water systems in the U.S. and some small ones are also included. It was detected above the minimum reporting level of 0.07 micrograms per liter in 22% of the water systems tested and above the health reference level, which was based on one in a million cancer risk, EPA's iris assessment of 0.35 parts per billion in 7% of the water system. So it's known that from EPA studies that it does occur really quickly. and I. Unless I missed it, I didn't see that reflected in, in EPA's documents. For the manganese, um, Dr. Beck talked about it some already, but um, I think that there's quite a bit of information that's relevant that needs, that should be included um, in considering manganese. Um, let's see. So, There's, exp in a, the, I, I didn't see the occupational studies about Parkinsonism mentioned in the SAB draft report. It may be discussed in EPA's documents, I don't know, but there are quite a few epidemiology studies about neurobehavioral toxicity in children and also animal studies, rat studies that support that. I gave some citations for reviews of this information in my comments. WHO World Health Organization 2021, Cher et al. Environmental Health Perspectives, which is authors from Minnesota Department of Health, and also a New Jersey DEP memo that I was part of writing, which is not <clears throat> online. I, I have. I'm going to revise my comments to say it's available by request, but in the um, draft CCL5 report, it, state, it talks about the WHO limit of 400 um, parts per billion. That's from 2011. In 2021, WHO came out, up with a more recent value based on more recent human and animal studies and updated their number to 80, which is five times lower than their previous um, value. So that needs to be included in, in this manganese discussion. And bottle-fed infants were identified as the sensitive subpopulation. 
and the critical effect for developing the 80 parts per billion number was neurodevelopmental effects in four well-conducted rat studies. Also, three other agencies have developed a similar number between 60 and 120 parts per billion, whereas WHO's 80, pretty close, based on the rat toxicology data. Minnesota Department of Health in Twen Health Canada that Dr. Beck mentioned, and the province of Quebec. New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services also developed a similar number of 100 parts per billion protective for infants using a different approach. So that's also a, another minor comment. It states that a, a TSDR set a maximum manganese level of five milligrams per day, but there was no citation and I looked for it and I couldn't find where a TSDR said that. So a citation needs to be added. I'm gonna try to finish up quick. So on to question number three, I didn't, understand the comment that the SAB suggested that EPA explicitly list the criteria for screening chemical contaminants from the initial universe to the preliminary CCLP CCL before the point-based scoring was applied because from what I saw in the EPA document it said that the point based scoring was applied to the entire initial universe of 22,000 to, to, and the 250 with the highest score were included in the PCCL in, unless I misunderstood it. I didn't understand the basis of that comment in the draft report. As far as the groups grouping of PFAS, Providing a table listing the specific piece fast by EPA, considered by EPA was suggested, but later in the same paragraph of the draft report, it's acknowledged that EPA may be considering PFAS as a whole rather than as individual compounds. The draft, re the draft CCL report, the EPA report talks about 4,000 PFAS and if the definition was changed. OECD talks about 9,000 PFAS. So if really all the PFAS are being considered, I didn't understand how there could be a table listing all of them. And it just was unclear if they're being considered as an entire group like total organic fluorine or something like that, or specific, just a very specific subset, because obviously you can't have a table with thousands of them. Other minor comments, I, when it talked about the communicable disease manual and suggested a more recent edition, it was suggested to check the edition that was cited, the older edition against the new edition, the information. I didn't understand why the SAB panel doesn't just suggest citing the newer document altogether. Um, I guess my last comment that I'll talk about here, I have other editorial comments in my comments. It wasn't clear to me whether the recommendation for renaming health effects to health risk applied to microbial contaminants or both microbial and chemical contaminants. And I think Dr. Weintraub mentioned that in her overview. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Post. We have two more lead reviewers, and then we'll move to um, responses from Dr. Weintraub. I will turn to Dr. Christy pullen fednick Yeah, great, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, a couple of my comments have already been mentioned by Dr. Post and Dr. Beck, so um, I'll just briefly touch on those for a little bit. So were the, just going through the questions, were the charge questions adequately addressed? I thought that they were. Um, so I'll say yes to that, keep it simple. Are there technical areas, errors or omissions uh, that were not adequately dealt with in the draft report? I didn't see any, but some of the other comments may be construed in that way. So just to, to point that out. 
uh, is the draft report clear and logical? I mean, I thought for the most part it was. It was uh, relatively easy to read and digest, but I also find my, myself at times needing to reference the tiered recommendation, what the tiers meant several times. And so, for example, in the manganese section, the second bullet in tier three, uh, which I have to go back and look at right now, seemed to be something that was either short term or suggested. If, give me a second, I can find that. Um, so this was, you know, the SAB suggests that the EPA carefully consider the points made above when deciding whether to include manganese and tungsten on future CCLs. And so, I mean, in some ways, um, it, it does seem future oriented, but because we're also talking about and the recommendations within the section seemed maybe to, to suggest that the, there should be a reconsideration in CCL5. I just wasn't sure about where that should be placed. Um, and there were there were a couple of other places in which there were there was language um, where it, um, you know, say on page 17, uh, bullet two talks about there's there's a, um, a second bullet on that page. Sorry, I didn't write down the quotes for the exact line um, that says that the EPA should consider. So this was uh, in tier one, the EPA should consider expanding the definition of PFAS. But the in tier one, it seems as though that something and all of the other language within the report mentioned, you know, very strongly, you know, include additional bullets, you know, do X, Y, or Z thing. And this one was a should consider. And so I wasn't sure if that should fall within tier two or if the language should be adjusted to say that this is a strong recommendation. So it seemed to be out of place in some ways and inconsistent with the tiers. So, um, and then I also, for the, the PFAS clarification that Dr. Post just mentioned, I also thought was something that um, could, could benefit from some additional clarification. So are the conclusions drawn or recommendations provided supported by the body of the draft? I mean, similar to Dr. Beck, the conclusions in section 2.3.1, uh, I, I wasn't actually clear what the recommendations were. So, in, you know, outside of the additional um, uh, literature that needed to be cited, uh, I wasn't, even you know, maybe this is just a quirky use of language, but I wasn't actually sure what carried from meant. If that's saying that it should need, it should be moved into the CCL6 process or it should be removed from the CCL5, it, it just wasn't clear to me. And so, um, yeah, so I already mentioned that I also wasn't sure why the second bullet in the tier one was there. Um, also for Campylobacter, so this is on page 13, lines 30 and 31. The line is, however, it would be unlikely for those US drinking water systems that maintain residual chlorine to become contaminated in the same way. There was no citation as to what the levels we would expect there to be for the residual chlorine, um, especially in rural systems. If that was the, the source of the issues in Canada, for example, I would be really concerned with removing Campylobacter Factor if we don't know whether or not the conditions could be replicated, um, you know, in the United States in particular. And so there was no explanation about, again, the, how, how common that would be, <clears throat> how, how common that would be or what the potential health risks associated with that could be domestically. And so I, I just think that additional information if we're making that recommendation would uh, need to be provided to justify its removal. And that's all that I had. Thanks, Dr. Pollenfednik. Uh, and finally, Dr. Peter Thorne, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Awesome. Yeah, good. All right, well, I thought the panel did a, a really excellent and comprehensive job and assessed the charge questions quite thoroughly. I know these are huge undertakings, and so I want to nod uh, to the committee, the panel about that. Um, and I, I didn't find uh, technical errors per se. I had a couple of comments, uh, nonetheless, that haven't been reflected in the uh, prior reviewers. Um, one was th there was some discussion about on page three about Legionella pneumophila being unregulated um, and, and saying that the text was inadequate. And But in the paragraph above, I thought it adequately described um, what the situation was and, and why uh, with regard to waterborne um, disease outbreaks and uh, attributable to Legionella. So perhaps the, the tier two bullet two comment about Legionella um, should be a little bit more clear as to why the text was judged to be inadequate. At least that wasn't clear to me in reading it. Um, the, on page um, 16, the panel uh, suggested specifically living, listing other saxitoxins, uh, but did not have a similar comment for microcystins, anatoxins, other cyanobacterial toxins. So there's 50, I guess, 50 microcystins. Um, and there's multiple saxitoxins. So, so what, what is the 
rationale for including additional saxitoxins and specifically listing them out, rather than just saying saxitoxins as a class and microcystins as a class and so forth. So I, I think some clarity on that could, could be helpful. Um, a third comment I had was with regard to um, this comment about what can EPA do to uh, replace the USGS monitoring efforts. Um, I think the comment was EPA should just develop a strategy to address the gap in. And I, I wondered if the panel had thought about what EPA could do to address the gap. And if so, uh, help by perhaps making some suggestions of what to do rather than just pointing out that they need to do it. Um, I don't know the answer, but I'm sure the panel does. <laughs> Um, then the, the, the last comment I, I just wanted with regard to conclusions drawn and recommendations provided, um, there's been a lot of talk from um, my um, colleagues who have articulated concerns about the manganese discussion, and that I think that needs some more work, and I'm sure that that's something the panel will, will take another look at. But I, I particularly have a, this concern about the application of high exposure occupational inhalation uh, in, in making informed judgments about low-level ingestion of manganese and the uh, validity of that um, high exposure and that pathway towards a drinking water um, guidance level. So again, the uh, panel did a great job and, and I enjoyed reading it. It was quite readable and uh, I think it's a, a nice contribution. So thank you. Thanks, Dr. Thorne. And I'll just add my thanks too to the panel. Um, certainly a tremendous amount of work and uh, and really excellent on our behalf. So Dr. Weintraub, I will return to you now. You are um, welcome to respond and, and discuss some of the points that were raised, um, and then we'll open it up to the rest of the SAP members. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And thank you all for your careful review of our draft. Um, can I just have a process question, whether it's for you, Dr. Cullen, or Dr. Um, Armitage, um, or Dr. Brennan? I'm never exactly sure. Um, do we, is, is the goal of this discussion to come up with uh, some specific ideas of how we might change the draft report? Um, or is it to, uh, yeah, I'm not, is, is the idea that we would make more revisions and then bring it back one more time to the SAB or how does that all work? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, so we are going to, to come up with, um, as a group, you know, a motion on, on what to do next. And that could include deciding that there are basically editorial level changes. Uh, and then the report would sort of be in the hands of yourself and, and me as the chair. Um, we could decide that there's more substantial edits and that the report would then be re-reviewed by uh, myself. And then we would designate a few board members who were you know, connected to particular questions because they had the expertise. Um, we could return the draft report to the panel and have a, a second quality review, although um, you know that's something we would have to think about if that's really where we were going. Um, or I'm just giving for the sake of completeness um, in, a, in a case of, of any report, um, it can always be sort of like completely redone. I'm just so for the sake of completeness. So I think we would be in the position as a board of deciding whether uh, changes that are needed are kind of at that editorial review level or whether there are a bit more substantive, but we would just have sort of a part or a few members of the board review or whether the full board wants to go back through the whole thing. So um, so you're, you're right on the money. That's the step we will be, you know, deciding as, as a board. Does that help you with? Absolutely. Yeah. And so um, maybe respond in light of, of you know, of where that. you think you would go with that. Right, exactly. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, because I think there are, um, there are some comments that, um, that, that we can, that we may decide we want to frame as editorial, um, because so much of the language in the panel's draft report talks about 
EPA considering make, making particular changes. And so I think in the light of um, some these additional pieces of information that many of the lead reviewers and um, and the other reviewers on the SAB had um, had given, I I I would like us to think about whether that actually changes our recommendation of saying EPA, please consider, um, you know, doing something or not doing something, um, and simply adding additional information. Um, I think the manganese is probably going to be the the one that will focus mo that that our discussion right now could focus on. But the, on the other hand, I I reread the comments um, and our original um, charge question comments from the panel members, and um, they're they're just. I think it is summarized in the report that there is not consensus. And um, and I think the uh, quality review comments raised some additional pieces of information that we should definitely add to the report. Um, and I th believe that that may not change what we end up thinking that EPA should do with this, which is look at some more information and carefully consider whether it makes sense to keep manganese on or um, or drop it off. Um, so that's that was sort of my main comment and um, framing, I think, everybody's, let's see, R with respect to the dioxane, I actually think that 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 um, Dr. Post, that was your comment. I think that's actually what we were trying to say um, in the in in the report, which is just that there are many and and with one four dioxane being an example of a byproduct that might not be captured in the current. Um, framework of of defining the universe and we were suggesting that um that that we would like to be able to capture things like one four dioxane and and so I yeah mean, why it was being called a byproduct because can you that's what caught my eye by because it's a unintentional byproduct in the i think in the manufacturers don't i think shampoos and things but that's really the other sources aren't normally called byproducts and that i thought you were referring to just it being made ex a little bit being made accidentally when consumer products were made and that was like the major issue with it maybe it's like a terminology issue it might be i think we right. were um, it came up in the way that you described and that you interpreted. And so I think that's part of why the- Stabilizer, it was added as a stabilizer to chlorinated solvents. It, maybe that, and that was, maybe they meant like, like byproduct might not be exactly the right word and it caught, that's what created my comments. <laughs> That's that's perfectly legitimate, and I I think thus easily resolved. Um, I think we the, the bottom line is is um, not just how it's characterized, but what we're trying to say, which is let's make sure that the universe captures um, some things that it hasn't captured, and um, and one for dioxane is one of the things that wasn't captured. It jumped and, out in UCMR3 as being occurring, be, being detected, like, as I said, in 22% mm -hmm. of the water systems and 7% above the health reference level. Mm -hmm. So like, I can't remember their process, but I assume it considered UCMR3 data. Okay, that's a that's great. So we can um, we can figure out how to address that. There's going to be because I think there will be more discussion, right? Um, but I I I have some ideas that I think will probably work. Um, and then uh, let's see. 
Yeah, I think uh, I think most of the other comments are um, pretty easily resolved or addressed um, simply by you know ex accepting the reviewers' comments and changing some language. Um, for example, the you know maybe we were a little too mild with our um, comment about the old version of the communicable disease manual. The intention was just to add, to recognize that perhaps the definite the wording hadn't changed um, between 2004 and whatever the most recent version was. But more than anything, to point out that there are frequently, relatively frequently updated versions, and they shouldn't just be carried over from each CCL. Um, but again, that's a, a, a simple and appropriate change to go ahead and make, in my opinion. Um, did we, uh, how would you like to proceed, Dr. I, yes, thanks. I, I'll ask uh, for other board member comments and then maybe circle back with the lead reviewers just to, to get a pulse. Um, it seems like we're somewhere between the decision about, you know, for substantive changes, um, having the report re-reviewed by designated board members versus whole board review once again, although um, that's sort of the decision point that we'll, we'll need to, to make. So let's hear from other board members here if there are any other issues out there that we haven't heard about yet or, you know, that are just different. Um, board members, other thoughts about this report? And then I'll return to the lead reviewers again. Just looking around the room, want to make sure we don't leave anyone out. All right, so it seems that what we've heard already are kind of the, the issues in the, in the comments. So lead reviewers, um, you know, you, you did great work looking and, and raising some additional information that should be included and some additional changes. Thoughts about where we are uh, in terms of disposition ultimately of, of what we'll do next and we'll vote, but I'm just, I thought it would be expedient to, to go back to the lead reviewers. Uh, Dr. Beck, did you have anything further or thoughts um, about that? My main thought is that I do think most of my comments and Dr. Post's comments uh, were, there, were there similar, could be addressed the way you suggest. But I wouldn't do it just as an addition because I think some of the present text that is there, uh, particularly as I know the specific sections in my comments, is not really accurate. So I would recommend that that not be retained. And there is a comment uh, in, in response to Dr. Prost, there is a comment about Parkinson's, but I admit it was just like one sentence. But it, in any case, my uh, comment with the proposed approach would be that it would be fine, but I wouldn't just add to what's there. I would take out what's really not as well supported as it should be. Yeah, thanks for clarifying on that. And I think the then we would move to a decision about would then the entire report go back to the whole board or would it obviously pluses and minuses um, go back to just some designated reviewers such as the lead reviewers. And so that's kind of where we'll um, but yes, additions as well as changes and, and taking out material if, it's, if it shouldn't be there. Let's see, I will go to uh, Dr. Post and then Poland Fednick and then Dr. Thorne. I agree with Dr. Beck that, and what you said, Dr. Cullen, that these can be addressed by adding and editing as appropriate. It's mostly fact, it's like factual information, not the conclusions basically. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pullen Fednick. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I think that in some ways the the, the Campylobacter uh, comment that I have, I mean, I I would just want to understand that a bit more. So that could result in actually removing that recommendation completely. Uh, and so again, maybe there's additional information that that could be cited, but um, it at least the case wasn't made in my mind that that it should be com considered even for removal. And so either it's additional information that needs to be supplied or additional information is obtained and then it's decided that that recommendation shouldn't be made at all. So it's editorial in some ways, but could also be significant in the sense that you're removing a recommendation. Yeah, a little more substantive. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Thorne. 
Yes, yeah, so so this is a the panel's report, and so the comments are about manganese and about diapsin, and um, about you know listing the PFAS and some of these other things. If I guess my question is, were these controversial uh, uh, decisions from the panel? Was there a lot, was there dissent among the panel about these things, or or would the panel I think be comfortable with uh, having these be sort of high level edits without coming back to them? That's a great question. Yes, I, I guess with all the talk about the manganese and dioxin, I forgot about the, my PFAS comment. And Dr. Weintraub, I was kind of curious about that one, about the table or if there's what you were suggesting. Yeah, I was just trying to look. Um, to clarify for myself what it is that we were trying to accomplish. And I think, I, I actually do think it is a um, potentially editorial with the way it's written in, um, in the original, let's see. Yeah. Uh, the original um, comment that was from an individual group member um, is uh, I'll read it to you. A table is given to list the DVPs considered, but there are several categories of contaminants listed as multiple under Exhibit 2A, and these do not have separate tables exhibits, such as the PFAS group. The public may wish to know which PFAS chemicals among the other multiple chemicals considered are considered. Uh, later, they are listed in Exhibit 13, but the suggestion was to consider describing all groups in closer proximity in the document. So what I'm thinking is that uh, we did not accurately characterize, um, kind of uh, fold that particular single comment from one of the panel members into our um, verbiage in the, the text. And I think we're trying to be a little bit less kind of, um, you know, detailed, but, uh, but I think if we change that verbiage to better reflect what was actually said, um, we might be able to fix that. So what was the list in table 13? Is it all the P? Because if it's thousands or if it's just a subset of a smaller subset, it makes a really big difference. That's the part I don't understand. There we go. I don't have that open right now, and I don't want to get, uh, I mean, I can <laughs> have a look, or if somebody else has the exhibit open. document this is going to be in the federal the original the main document the federal register okay, notice print it out so in the back or it would be exhibit 14 like exhibit exhibit 13 is the cc list of the ccl chemicals mm -hmm. and it lists I think like, like a list of PFAS, like 15, I don't know, 10 or something. I, I'm not counting them. Those are ones that were nominated. That doesn't, that's just what was nominated. Mm -hmm. And then right. PCL, it said they weren't including them because they're being treated as a class, a whole, I mean, in the other documents, 
these aren't these are just what the public nominated i think Oh, uh, I see. So maybe this was just a misunderstanding of what exactly Exhibit 13 was. Um, so this sounds like um, an area where, you know, taking another look and um, and with the, I think with the panel, P Dr. Thorne makes the excellent point that this is the panel's report. And so, you know, you have a number of raised items now for, for consideration. The panel, I think, looking at these and um, you know, making changes, there's some additions, there may be some places to take, take out. And then um, I think we're basically looking for a motion then on whether at that point after the panel did its work, because, you know, this does come from the panel, whether the report would return to say the lead reviewers uh, for, um, for assessment and for, you know, confirmation that, that the work is done or whether it return to the whole SAB board. And um, I think I'm ready to open this up to a motion from, certainly could be anyone on the board um, or in particular, if, uh, if one of the lead reviewers wants to make a motion. I think, you know, that's pro those are probably the two areas where, um, you know, it would be one of those based on what we've heard so far. Uh, let's see, Dr. Hamburg, I believe you're, yes, you're in the corner no, of my screen. I, there you are. As this, I'm a proceduralist on this one because this is well outside of my area of expertise, but I would, I would uh, put a motion forward to, um, um, I'm not going to have the right words, but have the lead review, it come back to the lead reviewers and that anyone on the SAB can ask to be consulted, but the lead reviewers be uh, empowered to do it because I think, as you know, as we know, we're a very diverse group, and I don't have it. I, I don't have anything more to add it as I think most others, and that's the most expeditious and appropriate. If with that qualifier, that anyone who would like to be consulted, but the lead reviewers would do the sign off and be empowered to do that. Yeah, that's a really nice motion, and we didn't hear comments from um, others on the board as of right now. Yes. So, is there a second for this motion? I'll second it. Thank you, Dr. Thorne. Uh, let's call for a voice vote. And then if we need to, we can do a roll call. Uh, all in favor that this panel will return to their report with the information they've received and make those changes um, as a panel. And then that the report would go back to the lead reviewers. And if another few or, or all members of the board decide they want to be added to that group that will re-review, um, folks would, would, let, would let us know. Um, yeah, so all in favor of this as an approach, please say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Oh, thank you. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, so this, I think this is a great outcome. And again, really want to thank the panel for, for their hard work so far and also um, for, you know, diligence returning with this information and these, and these points to address them. Thanks. So we are going to move to a new agenda item. I think I will call for a five minute break. I know these meetings can get kind of long. And so let's take a five minute break. It's 1122 on my clock here. So 1127, we'll, we'll reconvene and we'll turn to our next agenda item. Thanks.
All right, let's reconvene. Welcome back. All right, so uh, our next agenda item is to discuss the recommendations that the SAB work group for review of science supporting EPA decisions has put forward to the board. Um, I'd like to review the responsibilities of that SAB work group first. SAB is required by law to receive information from EPA about the science supporting planned regulatory actions when those actions are provided to any other federal agency for formal review or for comment. And the board then may decide to review the adequacy of the scientific and technical basis of the planned regulatory actions. The SAB work group um, is a subset of this body, plays an important role in the process because it makes recommendations to the full SAB about whether there's a need to review the science supporting the planned action. The work group for review of science supporting EPA decisions was formed in November of 2021. That body consists of myself as chair, David Allen, Jay Chakraborty, Stephen Hamburg, Marcus Hendricks, Sheila Olmsted, Christy Pullen-Fednick, Amanda Rodewall, Jonathan Samet, Richard Smith, Peter Thorne, and June Weintraub. And I thank all of them for their contributions on that work group. The work group most recently met on May 27th uh, and also on June 24th to discuss the adequacy of the scientific and technical bases supporting eight planned EPA regulatory actions and to recommend whether the chartered SAB should review these for adequacy of the science supporting these actions. The planned actions discussed by the work group, um, this gets to be a little bit of alphabet soup, but I'll, I'll list them off so that we're all on the same page. Uh, the first is uh, niche apps, it's gasoline distribution technology review and standards of performance for bulk gasoline terminals review, and that's RIN 2060 AU 97. Uh, second is federal recreational water quality criteria applicable to certain waters in New York, and that's RIN 2040 AG 08. Third is water quality standards, regulatory revisions to protect tribal reserved rights. That's RIN 2040 AG 17. Fourth is the new source performance standards review for industrial surface coating of plastic parts for business machines. That's RIN 2060 AV 23. Fifth is renewable fuel standard programs. This is RFS. Alternative Renewable Identification Number RIN Retirement Schedule for Small Refineries, and that's RIN 2060 AV72. Sixth is Accidental Release Prevention Requirements, Risk Management Programs under the Clean Air Act, Safer Communities by Chemical Accident Prevention, that's RIN 2050 AH22. Seventh is designating PFO and PFOS as CERCLA hazardous substances. That's RIN 2050 AH09. And eighth and final, federal implementation plan for prong one and prong two infrastructure requirements, interstate transport, for the 2015 eight hour primary ozone NACs. And that's RIN 2060 AV51. My memo to the board dated July 5th documents the work group's recommendations and provides background information. The work group found that none of the eight planned actions considered warranted further review by the SAB. And I would now like the board to discuss the work group recommendations in the memorandum and reach agreement on any further actions that are needed. And I would just add that these eight are in addition to other actions that we've been reviewing and that you've been hearing about um, where we have taken a, a whole series of different um, board activities stemming from that. This is a set um, that we are putting forward as um, that, that none of them warrant further review, but certainly that's not because that, that that's uh, in the context of a whole set where we're doing a variety of other additional steps. Uh, are there any questions about this process? All right, looks like we're all ready to go. Uh, so um, 
So I'll review briefly the recommendation on each and then see if there's discussion needed and then we'll, we'll vote on each one either to approve or disapprove the work group recommendation on the action. So uh, the first is the NESHAP, National Emission Standards for Hazardous Air Pollutants for Gasoline Distribution Technology Review and Standards of Performance for Bulk Gasoline Terminals. Uh, this is RIN 2060 AU 97. So in this action, EPA has proposed to revise NESHAP requirements for storage tanks, loading operations, and equipment leaks to reflect cost-effective developments in practices, process, or controls. The planned action is also proposing new source performance standards to reflect the best system of emissions reduction for loading operations and equipment leaks. And in addition, the EPA is proposing revisions related to emissions during periods of startup and shutdown and malfunction to add requirements for electronic reporting of performance test results and performance evaluation reports and compliance reports. Also to revise monitoring and operation requirements for control devices and to make other minor technical improvements. The work group looked uh, closely at these materials, found that this planned action does not warrant further review by the chartered SAB because it has been classified by the EPA as substantive non-significant. It's largely procedural, um, including establishing new requirements since the development of the original rules and the science is well established for these sources. So I will open this up to discussion from the board. Um, I'll look around for hands and then we'll turn to a motion and a vote. Are there questions or discussion points about this item? Does not appear to be. So is there a motion to, um, to then approve the work group's recommendation? Oh, Steve Hamburg, go ahead. I'll just uh, keep the procedural stuff going here. Um, yeah, so uh, I would um, have a motion to accept the recommendation of the working group. Thank you. Is there a second? I second. So Thanks, Dr. Bruder. Uh, let's have a voice vote then. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, the motion carries. So this action does not warrant further review um, as proposed by the work group and as agreed by the board. So the second rule, and I realize this is you know very procedural, but I think it's important that we all have, have a chance to look at each one and, and make sure that we're all not just putting them in a big group or something. Uh, the next rule is uh, federal recreational water quality criteria applicable to certain waters in New York. It's RIN 2040 AG08. Uh, EPA is proposing recreational criteria for certain saline surface waters in New York based on EPA's 2012 National Clean Water Act Section 304A recommended water quality criteria, recreational water quality criteria. On March 17th, 2018, uh, EPA disapproved New York's revised water quality criteria for fecal coliform and total coliform. Um, this is for recreational again, as not protective of certain waters around New York City for primary contact recreation, designated use classification, uh, and not based on sound science. Since the state did not remedy this disapproval, EPA is now fulfilling its statutory obligation to promulgate scientifically defensible and protective water quality criteria for these primary contact waters. The SAB work group found that this planned action does not warrant further review by the chartered board because it is considered localized in scope for those specific waters within the state. So I will open this one up for discussion um, and then ultimately a motion to approve or disapprove. Is there comment or discussion on this item? All right, is there a motion that, oh, someone just said something. Yeah, so this is Mark Lishavai. Is The question would be, if, if making the decision on a local basis sets some kind of precedent for national consideration, um, 
Yeah, I, I don't. I'm not familiar with the regulatory. Well, the, the, whether it sets a regulatory precedent, and uh, and therefore because it's done in New York, it could be expanded other places. In which case, maybe there is a value looking at the scientific basis. Mm. Right, and EPA was. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, the, so um, others may have comments on this one. So EPA was um, disapproving the revised water quality criteria of New York as not being protective. And then by statute, they then have to uh, promulgate a scientifically defensible and protective criterion. Um, is that a precedent? Thoughts from the board? I'm not sure that Colin, but my understanding is that, you know, this is this kind of thing where if a state doesn't uh, carry out its function uh, to the judgment of the EPA, that they have the authority to step in and, and do so. And that's that happens in a number of areas with uh, water quality issues having to do with uh, soil confinement operations and PDES permits and other such things. So in that sense, I, I think this is... Uh, fairly um, common thing for them to do. So others can yeah. correct me if I'm wrong. Thank you. Dr. Bruder, go ahead. Um, to me, I, I guess I would in, endorse what um, Dr. Thorne just said, because I think that that is what they're, I mean, the way I read it, they're just following up on their, their um, regulatory authority. So. Yeah, I guess my question isn't so much about the regulatory authority. I agree if they have to, they deem it adequate, they go in. But the question is, is what EPA put into place? And I you know, didn't read it past our comments. But the question is, what EPA imposed on the state scientifically valid? Um, but and, not, um, have, they made, have they made that next step? My understanding is the question to us is not only did they uh, assert their regulatory authority, agree that they have that responsibility, but the question that's scientific to the SAB is then what did they assert? Was that scientifically sound? Yeah, I mean, it says that uh, they have a statutory obligation to promulgate scientifically defensible and protective criteria and so you're asking is it uh scientifically and technically yeah. defensible um and i was i'm looking back at some of the materials here because there was quite a bit of stuff um they develop criteria you know across many locations as dr thorne was saying uh and so my understanding is that they're using um they're using criteria that are also for other places that are that are also um, in place. Let's see if I can tell you something exactly. Yeah, there are beaches. It's not exactly my area, but there are beaches criteria that mm -hmm. have been based on epidemiological studies that have set E. coli and ercoxi levels. Mm -hmm. Uh, on risk. Yeah, that's what, I'm uh, anyway, well. I'm, that's what I'm reading as well. There certainly yeah. is the ability to do that. Um. Yeah, and they had, I mean, over time, they have had recreational water quality criteria and they've updated them uh, periodically as well. So um, they're not doing something new for, for this particular location. Okay. Well then I, I don't object to okay. their actions. Yeah. yeah. Did someone want to add something if I'm yeah. especially if I'm casting it wrong? The, the key sentence I think in, in the summary was that uh, the EPA disapproved New York's revised water quality criteria for fecal coliform and total total coliform 
form, i.e. recreational criteria, as not being protective of the primary contact recreation designated use in certain waters around New York City and not being based on sound science? Um, this is Barbara. It, it seems to me we're not being asked to make a statement about specifically what EPA is going to propose, but whether they have the authority to go forth and do so, um, I don't know how such criteria may vary from location to location based on different um, physical chemical parameters of the water bodies, for example. So I don't, I don't have the knowledge as to whether there are rigid criteria that are applicable to the US or this is a judgment that they will make at the time when they do their analysis if New York State doesn't come forth. But I don't know that we're being asked to comment on any specific criteria that they may propose as long as it's going to be more protective than what New York State has done. Yeah, yeah it has yeah. to be protective and it has to be scientifically defensible. Those are the, the standards for this. And, and I think what they're following is the 2012 Recreational Water Quality Criteria document that was, uh, it's been enforced since 2012. Yeah, and that's, as I said, over time from 1986 uh, up until the present, periodically they, they revisit and review those. So yeah, I, I believe that's what we're being asked to weigh in on is um, that this is not, that we don't need to review the science for EPA fulfilling their statutory requirement of um, promulgating for these waters where they're trying to bring it into alignment since they uh, disapproved of New York's um, of New York's own water quality criteria for fecal coliform and total coliform for recreational. So I, th I think we are all agreeing that that's what we're doing. Um, that's certainly how I read it. I was wondering if we're ready for a motion on this one, or is this one that we're wanting more discussion on? So this is Mark. I'm I'm good with this. We can proceed. Uh, okay. Okay. Certainly. Uh, so the the work group um, was recommending to the full board that this does not require further review of the science on this particular step that that EPA is taking. So uh, I would like to call for a motion to either approve or disapprove the work group's recommendation. I approve the re recommendation, Mark Lachoy. Yeah. Right. I second. Okay, so there's a motion to uh, approve the workers' recommendation that this one does not need further review. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, thank you. And thank you for raising those questions. All right, so the next action we looked at um, is titled Water Quality Standards Regulatory Revisions to Protect Tribal Reserved Rights. This is RIN 2040 AG 17. In this rule, uh, EPA is pursuing a change to its water quality standards regulations to ensure that water quality standards do not impair tribal reserved rights. The rule will give clear direction to states when developing water quality standards where tribes hold reserved rights. Uh, the work group found that this planned action does not warrant further review by the chartered board because it's mainly procedural and it's focused on codification of amendments to ensure tribal reserved rights and it does not include any new science or analysis. So I will open this up for discussion at this time. Seeing no hands, is there a motion? The work group again has um, recommended that this does not require further review of the science. Is there a motion to approve the work group's recommendation? <laughs> Dr. Benke. I move to approve the work group recommendation. Is there a second? Second. 
Thank you, Dr. Omer. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. All right, we are now at new source performance standards review. Let's see which number is this. This is the fourth one. Okay, we're almost halfway there. Uh, so this is new source performance standards review for industrial surface coating of plastic parts for business machines. This is RIN 2060 AV23. Uh, in this action, the EPA is proposing amendments to the standards of performance for industrial surface coating. This is for plastic parts for business machines. It's based on the preliminary results of the review of the new source performance standards that are required by the Clean Air Act. The work group found this planned action does not warrant further review because it's also mainly procedural and it's implementing a Clean Air Act requirement. Is there any member who would like to discuss or raise points about this particular action? All right, the work group has proposed that this one does not warrant scientific review. Is there a motion to approve the work group suggestion? I'll make the motion. Thanks, Dr. Arvai. Is there a second? I second. Thank you, Dr. Bruder. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, thank you. Now we're on number five. So the next rule is renewed fuel standard RFS program, uh, alternative renewable identification number, RIN, retirement schedule for small refineries. This is RIN 2060 AV72. In this action, uh, EPA is proposing a renewable identification number retirement schedule for small refineries. This is under the Renewable Fuel Standard Program for the 2020 compliance year. The work group found that this action does not warrant further review because it's procedural, uh, considered routine, and it's related to compliance deadlines that are in place. Is there discussion about this action or comment from the board? Allison, um, this is Dr. Neptune. I, I, I want to kind of ask kind of, a, kind of a general question, and that is, is there any circumstance where something can be deemed procedural and still yet be subjected to review by the committee? Oh, good question. Uh, hmm. Yeah, what do folks think about that? This is Joe. I'm sorry, that audio broke up. It might be my connection. So I didn't actually hear the question. Could you restate? Yeah, um, I'm relatively new to the board. And I was asking, is there any circumstance in which one of these kind of proposals can be deemed procedural and yet still be subject to kind of review by the board? Yeah, I'm wondering if Tom Brennan has anything to say about that one. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll keep it open ended and saying yes, it is possible for something procedural to warrant board review, you know, in the big picture scheme of things. But we do use uh, procedural as one of the screening processes. You know, we, we have uh, several you know, hundreds of these actions to screen through. And we try to narrow in on novel new science or science that maybe try to identify peer review weaknesses that may exist and one of the things I always tell the work group and the board members is that as an SAB, you're on your, your best footing and adding your best value when, when you're working on the science foundation of EPA work. And um, so one of the reasons you'll hear it's procedural in nature is one of our initial sort of screens about what the board should and shouldn't be interested in based on a long list of, of items that are before us. So it's not necessarily the kiss of death, basically. No, not necessarily. So I, I was trying to think of example, you know, an example of that sort of counterfactual. Um, maybe Peter Thorne has one. I see your hand is up. 
Yeah, well, I'm I'm thinking back to 2016 or so. I, I, I don't remember the specifics, but I do remember that there have been occasions where uh, the work group has felt contrary to the judgment of EPA or maybe the SAB staff that something isn't just procedural, that there is there are important scientific issues or maybe something new has come out um, that informs this. And, and again, we're always evaluating the whether the underlying science has been properly used and considered. And so, so you know, if, if, if anybody looks at this and says, well, they're saying procedural, but I really think there's some important science here, um, then bring it forward. It's, it's really something that the work group or the SAB should be doing. Thanks, Peter and Tom. <laughs> Sure. Thank you both. Uh, let's see, where are we? Did we vote on this one yet? No, I don't think so. All right, so this is uh, related to compliance deadlines, is considered routine. Um, again, that word procedural. <laughs> uh, is there a motion to uh, approve or disapprove the workers recommendation of no further review? I move that we um, accept your recommendation. Thanks, Dr. Bruder. Is there a second? Second. second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Also, aye. Oh, thank you. <laughs> any opposed? And any abstentions? Thank you. All right, so we're deep into our list at this point. Tom Brennan, did you want to add something? I saw your screen just lit up. No, sorry, I didn't. Okay. That's okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure it's hard to see everyone. There's a big group here. All right, so we are at, um, I think this is seventh. No, it's sixth. Uh, accidental release prevention requirements risk management programs under the Clean Air Act, safer communities by chemical accident prevention. This is RIN 2050-AH22. So in this rule, EPA is considering revising the risk management program, the RMP regulations, which implement the requirements of section 112 R7 of the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments. The risk management program requires facilities that use extremely hazardous substances above specified threshold quantities to develop plans to enhance safety and security in chemical facilities. EPA is revising this rule in accordance with Executive Order 13990, which is protecting public health and the environment and restoring science to tackle the climate crisis. Uh, this executive order directs federal agencies to review existing regulations and take actions to address priority established by the new administration, including bolstering resilience to the impact of climate change and also prioritizing environmental justice. The SAB work group first reviewed this action on May 27th, 2022. Then the work group requested a briefing on the proposed action from EPA since the Procedural aspects of the rule would pose significant implications for environmental justice communities. So we wanted to look at that. Um, the work group received a briefing from the EPA on the proposed action on June 24th, and then reviewed additional information provided by EPA's alum, the Office of Land and Emergency Management. Uh, the additional information received, we had an overview of methods that were used by EPA and the assessment of impacts or benefits to EJ communities as part of the proposed action. Um, I had a few other notes about this one too. You know, the focus here is on preventing accidents um, in these sorts of facilities. So there's a methodology that's used to sort basically 11,000 facilities into categories, either um, a category where the public could be affected if there was an accident at that facility or uh, at the other extreme, a category where public would be, not be exposed. And then an intermediate group where um, there were considerations that sort of fell in between the it was great to have this briefing because the accident rate has really decreased. The vast majority have no accidents, which is obviously that the focus is really on preventing accidents. Um, the RMP rule over time is seeking to encompass EJ and, and climate change provisions. The working group was kind of tracking development of some of these underlying methods um, because they're applied well beyond this particular action. And I think that 
um, you know, we're interested in continuing to track development with those methods and how this executive order and its implications across lots of different regulatory actions will unfold. Um, so for this particular action, which is sort of one, one slice of that, uh, the work group found that the planned action did not warrant further review. I'm happy to call for a discussion on this one at this point. I don't see any hands. I think this is a topic that will continue to be interesting though, the, the broader sort of umbrella topic. Um, all right, is there a motion to approve the work group's recommendation of no further review? This is Lisa Lomfight, so Lisa. moved. Thank you. Second. second. Thank you for the second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? And any abstentions? All right, the motion carries. So we will not be digging further into that one. Although, as I say, this is, involves a number of issues that we're continuing to track and will continue to track. Uh, let's see. So we now have the second to last rule. The next rule is designating PFOA and PFOS as circla hazardous substances. This is RIN 2050AH09. Uh, this proposal would designate perfluorooctanoic acid, PFOA, and perfluorooctane sulfonic acid, PFOS, as hazardous substances. Such a designation would require facilities across the country to report on PFOA and PFOS releases. The work group found that this planned action does not warrant further review by the full board because no new scientific work was initiated as part of the regulatory action. Uh, the work group noted that this regulatory action is supported by existing scientific studies, external studies, they're peer reviewed and they're published to satisfy the statutory language. And the SABP FAST review panel has reviewed the science described in EPA's analysis to support EPA's national primary drinking water rulemaking for PFAS, which we'll be talking about in two days. I will open discussion now on this particular action. Not seeing any hands, I will call for a motion to approve the work group's recommendation of no further review. I make a motion to approve the work group's recommendation. Thank you, Dr. Beck. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Guggenheimer. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, thank you. The motion carries. And we have the final action of this set. Uh, this is federal implementation plan for prong one and prong two infrastructure requirements. Uh, that's interstate transport for the 2015 eight hour primary ozone NAX. This is RIN 2060 AV51. Uh, in this action, EPA is proposing federal implementation plan requirements to address 26 states obligations to eliminate significant contribution to non-attainment or interference with maintenance of the 2015 ozone NAX in other states. Uh, the work group found that this planned action does not warrant further review because it does not involve scientific approaches that are new to the agency. The scientific and technical basis that are used in this rulemaking have also been used in previous uh, national and regional ozone transport rulemakings, and they're not new to EPA. The action would apply in certain states where EPA has either disapproved a, quote, good neighbor state implementation plan submission under Clean Air Act Section 110A2D. I-1, or has made a finding of failure to submit such a SIP submission for the 2015 ozone NACs. The work group uh, reviewed information provided by EPA about this planned action. We noted that the Clean Air Science Advisory Committee ozone panel is discussing any new scientific and or technical developments related to the ozone NACs. So that's uh, in a separate category and is being considered by the, the CASAC, which is their, their purview. 
So I open this final of the eight um, action for discussion. Is there, is there discussion among the members? I see no hands. Then I would call for a motion to approve the work group's recommendation of no further review. I move the motion to accept the recommendation. Thank I'll you. Start. Thank you for the second as well. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Well, thank you for your stamina. Those were the eight actions that were not uh, recommended for further review. We certainly have um, in our recent meetings have had some that, that are recommended for further review. So we're you know working our way through those, but this is a great set for us to discuss today. Um, so this was the conclusion of the agenda that we had planned for today. This group is incredibly efficient. Um, we're only two hours into it. I will quickly consult with Tom Armanage and Tom Brennan, uh, are we ready to move ahead with our agenda for July 20th or should we reconvene on July 20th so that we have all the players in place? I know that not everyone can make every meeting. And I see a hand up from, uh, it looks like Deanna Share. And I have a hand from Steve Hamburg. So um, if you wanted me to answer the question, yes, um, part, of the, part of the reason why we split the, the meeting was because of availability of key staff of the SAB itself and who was here on Monday and who was here on Wednesday. So we've actually mm -hmm. uh, made an arrangement with the folks from Office of Water to give an opening presentation on Wednesday. So although we've been effective, um, our goal is not to necessarily fill all the available time that this, is, this, yeah, this is just fine. <laughs> And um, we'll, uh, I think we'll be ready, you know, more ready as a team on third, on Wednesday. So. Wednesday. Yeah. No, I wanted to make sure because sometimes we do try to go ahead and, and advance on our yeah, agenda a little bit. But this is one. Yeah. I know that also board members were planning their time accordingly where folks um, had travel and other things. So, um, yeah, we'll have the right group. Dr. Hamburg, you've got your hand up. Sorry about that. Okay. got a phone call right in the middle of that. Um, yeah, so I was just going to uh, say, and I missed whatever last thing I said, uh, is um, just I think that if we have a schedule, we should just stick to it. And that may have been said previously, just so that people know. I think otherwise it gets hard and people tuning in who are not on the SAB, so it doesn't feel fair. So e even though I will miss much of next, I'll be on a plane for a good bit of the SAB to, uh, on Wednesday, but I think we should just stick with that unless there's a compelling reason to do otherwise. Yeah, understood. I, I mean, we're always trying to decide how much time different topics take. So it is the case that when we sometimes don't fill the time on one day, we may spill over on the, the other day, but that's just a risk you know, that we'll take. Uh, Dr. Sher, you've got your hand up and then Dr. Beck. Yes, thank you. So I, I wasn't expecting the discussion of the CCL report to go by quite that fast. And I think I missed um, my one opportunity to make a comment. So, um, so I was thinking that it would be the discussion would be going as long as it showed in the agenda. So, is there any way to send a written comment that can be considered, or because I, I I missed that opportunity? Yeah, we. Um, so, what category of comment? Let's see. You are in MDH. So the reason yeah. I was reviewing that is because we, we have another public comment period. Um, and the, oh no, the main, I am the you're not. liaison member. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I think we could have that now because this was definitely the day to talk about CCL and uh, yeah. Okay, I'll just quickly make a comment and I'm, I'm yeah, coming sure to this a little bit late. So um, I'm sure that if this was already discussed um, in previous meetings, I, I, I apologize, but um, it, it seemed to me that um, one of the charge questions explicitly asked um, the SAB to comment on the process used to consider sensitive populations. And um, in the response to that, um, 
I, you know, I saw something about, you know, compromised individuals, but really there was no tier one recommendation related to sensitive populations. And there was one tier two recommendation to just um, explain a little, or let's see, explain a little further how um, sensitive populations were considered for chemical contaminants. And it just seems like there maybe is an opportunity missed for the SAB to um, expand a little bit more in recommendations around sensitive populations since it was specifically asked by EPA. And I think there was enough in sort of the screening process that EPA presented that um, I feel like a little bit more could be expanded upon um, related to that. So that's the, the only comment I wanted to add. Yeah, thanks. Uh, let's see, Dr. Weintraub, did you want to make any note there? Go ahead. Sure. So uh, by way of catching you up um, in the part that you missed, um, we did basically what we decided was that we would take written Oh, take all of the comments received during this meeting and that were sent prior um, and make some revisions that address them and then bring them back uh, and work with the panel um, to make some revisions and then bring them back to the lead reviewers and any other um, interested parties. But you're a liaison, right? And not... Um, so I'm wondering if maybe the way to handle this would be if one of either the lead reviewers that's on SAB or um, I mean, if it's appropriate to to loop her into that process of um, kind of back and forthiness, um, I'm perfectly happy to do that. But if not, then maybe one of the existing um, lead reviewers or, or SAB members would be interested or willing to kind of take that on to make sure that any changes we make in trying to address that um, comment. Yeah, I think I'd be happy if just the lead reviewers maybe just take a second look and maybe think about whether anything a little more specific might could be added to this instead of elaborate on how EPA did this. Um, and whether that recommendation in itself, based on what EPA comes back with, if there gonna be follow-up to that, once you they do elaborate, I I just wanna make sure it doesn't kind of slip through the cracks. So I'm happy to have any, any of the lead reviewers if they have any thoughts on this or ideas to go ahead and address it. Thanks, um, I, I think that is a, a good way to handle it. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Weintraub, there was a little delay there. Yeah, no, that's fine. If that's the if if there's agreement, then I don't want to open up new potential path. There's lots of different ways to handle this, I think, and um, and this seems like a good. One. I think it's all right. I'll just look to Tom Brennan right. quickly to see if he's uh, having hard time about this or if he's all right. Yeah, that seems very appropriate. <laughs> we, uh, we really enjoy having our liaisons here. I think it cr uh, creates a lot of synergy between the federal advisory committees. That handle science work and we welcome their input. Um, they're not voting members, but um, as uh, Deanne just uh, demonstrated, they're here to give comments as appropriate and to contribute to the discussion. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Dr. Beck, you had your hand uh, up as um, well. My, quest, my question relates to the uh, first commenter from ACC who made comments about PFAS and not about CCL. <coughs> And what happens to those comments since they were made on the wrong day? Well, so actually we have um, bookended the whole two day meeting, which is considered you know, a whole agenda, even though it's spread across two days to have public comment. Um, I, and so, I mean, I think the fact that those comments were made today, you're just, you're con your concern is that the comments wouldn't be heard by people who would only be at the meeting next time or who specifically mm -hmm. wanted to be part of the conversation about that action. Uh, do we have a written version of that comment as well? I'm looking to... Uh, he, uh, this is Tom Armitage. Uh, yeah. He just sent us uh, a written version of his comment, so I will make sure everyone gets that. And it's also posted on our website. 
Yeah, that's we usually do have written copies of things that are presented verbally as well. And I also just want to add, he has signed up to make clarifying uh, oral comments at the end of the day tomorrow. Or on on Wednesday. Wednesday, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it is certainly the case that uh, at the end of the meeting, we often have comments across the entire, you know, all the topics across both days and so forth. And so that those bookended public comment periods, um, yeah, they, they get used different ways. So thanks, Dr. Beck, for raising that. It sounds like the written version will be available to everyone. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Other comments or questions from the group? This is Mark Weshavai. If I'm on the phone, I can't raise my hand. Okay, um, thanks. Well, well, one of the comments that resonated with me was basically my big concern on the PFAS was raised by our commenter this, you know, um, earlier which was around the timing. And if this is something that EPA is willing to, or prepared to address on Wednesday, you know, EPA issued the health advisory in advance of the SAB review. And that, um, I don't know, that just kind of bothered me that, well, what happens if that, if that gets, you know, if the SAB comes back and, and has, you know, serious uh, concerns with the, with the health advisory levels, the EPA who, ready to withdraw withdraw that. So um, if if uh, I, I, so, I agreed with that comment this morning. Um, this morning, and uh, if that's something that um, EPA can um, can address on their their presentation on Wednesday, uh, I'd be most interested to hear hear about yeah, that think- process. A number of people have uh, have shared that comment. You know, the policy process is a process. It's not always linear. It is iterative. But I'm going to turn to Tom Brennan because he's got his hand up and probably knows more about what's coming. Yes. Yeah, so in terms of content, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Lechevier. We um, we invited uh, two senior officials at Office of Water to come to address that very point on Wednesday. So they'll be talking about right. um, about that, what's happening, and how it relates to the work of the SAB and. So that that'll be a big part of the discussion. And I, I think Thank your you. yep. your question is shared by others too. So really appreciate you raising it, but but certainly uh, you're not the only one. Uh, let's see, Doctor Post. I I don't want to speak for EPA, but or what they're going to say. But I've heard because <coughs> I'm in a lot of state groups and things. I've heard maybe like three webinars from the Office of Water on the, the interim health advisories, and I'm, there's going to be another one tomorrow, actually, and they, in all of the ones I've heard, they address Dr. Le Chevalier's question, comment, so I know they're going to address that issue, at least based on what I've heard in the other webinars that they've given on the topic. Thank you. <clears throat> and as I say, I think it is a question shared by others on the, on the board. So yeah, appreciate that. All right. Uh, are there other comments or discussion points? I don't see any, but if you're on the phone, please speak up now because it's true that your hand raising doesn't show up for us. In fact, there is no hand raising on the phone. All right. It looks like we're Looks like we're all right for now. All right, so I'd like to thank all the board members, uh, really productive meeting uh, and board liaisons for discussing the EPA planned actions and also the quality review of CCL5. The chartered SAB will reconvene at 1 p.m. on July 20th, so that's Wednesday, uh, 10 a.m. on the West Coast. And we'll receive a briefing from EPA on the drinking water health advisories for PFAS. We'll conduct a quality review of the SAB draft report, review of EPA's analyses to support EPA's national primary drinking water rulemaking for PFAS. Any other questions about where we are, where we're headed? All right, well, we have wrapped up our agenda. So I would like to call on our designated federal officer to recess the meeting until Wednesday, July 20th. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I will recess the, today's meeting and look forward to talking to all of you on Wednesday. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks all. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, goodbye. <laughs>